All right, guys. I can't go on camera today. I have a rash on my face, probably from the heat. It is itchy and a hot mess, and trying to cover it up with anything just looks just burns and doesn't feel good and doesn't look especially good. So no mug today, but you're here for the content, not my face so much. Um, and yeah, I'm talking about this World Health Organization declaring compulsive video gaming an addictive behavior disorder. And I want to show you a tale of two articles because I want to show how well done journalism can, can create uh, understanding of an issue and put it in its proper context, whereas bad journalism can incite panic and, you know, increase stigma and fear. So the first article I want to show you is it's on the CBC website, but it is by the Associated Press, meaning CBC just paid a pre-written article, put it up. And it, it, just states the case off the top. World Health Organization declares compulsive video game and addictive behavior disorder. But right away in the subheading, no more than 3% of gamers would be considered to have the mental health condition. And so that automatically shows that this is something I'm not sure I, I entirely support the theory that it is a standalone condition. But it is something one way or another that affects a very, very small number of people uh, compared to things like anxiety and depression that are much more common. It's important to keep in mind that between one in five and one in four people throughout their life will experience some sort of mental health condition, some sort of mental health challenge. So um, that that requires that requires therapy of some kind. So it is common you know, 20 to 25% of the population struggles with things, 3% is dwarfed by that number. So they, they go on and on throughout this article, making it clear that it is very rare. Um, and they say they start off very well. The World Health Organization says compulsive playing video games now qualifies as a mental health condition, specifically an addictive behavior disorder. The statement on Monday confirmed the fears of some players, but led critics to warn that it may risk stigmatizing too many young video players. Um, that is textbook proper journalism. You state the issue, you state, you know, the pros and cons of the issue. So some parents are reassured, some critics think it increases stigma. Awesome. Totally fair and balanced article. It is not taking a side here. And that's the way journalism is done. It then goes on to define um, uh, addictive, addictive behavior, addictive gaming, um, as impaired control over gaming, increased priority given to gaming over other activities to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other interests and daily activities and continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences. But it also goes on to say that the behavior would have to significantly appear normal functioning to meet the criteria and would normally have been going on for at least 12 months. So know that binge you did over the weekend of Fortnite or ARK you're not addicted to gaming. This has to severely impact your life, meaning you lose your job, you flunk out of school, something like that, um, for at least a year. That's not what most people think of. Most people, you know, anyway, I'm, I, I am holding my powder until later. Um, they do say, they, they talk to psychologists who do not agree with this decision, they talk to people who do, but they said that people need to understand this doesn't mean every child who spends hours in their room playing games is an addict. Otherwise, medics are going to be flooded with requests for help. Um, there's one part that I went er, on this article, but it it salvaged itself. Uh, somebody by the name of Dr. Mark, Mark Griffiths. Um, He's a uh, professor of behavioral addiction at Nottingham Trent University, studied video game disorder for 30 years. He says video gaming is like a non-financial kind of gambling from a psychological point of view. Gamblers use money as a way of keeping score, whereas gamers use points. That is not true of many modern games. There's 
more and more games that don't involve points at all. I mean, perhaps the sort of gamers who who play a lot of like leaderboards like that, that competitive instinct that that, you know, the, the typical male gamer plays for. Yeah, that's based on points or ranking or standing. But when you look at the reasons that um, women or, or transgender non-binary uh, gamers play games, that competitive, that building up points, that that um, uh, element doesn't uh, doesn't factor in. It's things like completion and exploration and design. And uh, so that's that's a sweeping generalization. Maybe, you know, he's saying that the games that do have points are are uh, um, more likely to be, quote unquote, addictive. And I can see his point there. But as much as I disagree with this statement, I don't think that this guy's opinion is dangerous because he then goes on to say, and this is good journalism as well, because I could have just pulled that quote and gone for maximum, maximum, you know, sensationalization. But instead, they temper his statement with what he said next. He says, playing video games for the vast majority of people is more about entertainment and novelty, citing the overwhelming popularity of games like Pokemon Go. We have these short obsessive bursts. And yes, people are playing a lot, but it's not an addiction. Okay. I can disagree with him on the gaming and gambling metaphor, but I can go, all right, dude, I have no problem with your general opinion because you realize that, you know, somebody really loving a game, it's not unhealthy. It's not an addiction. Um, He also said, and this is interesting, because remember at the beginning, it says it's no more than 3%. This expert, who has been studying the problem for 30 years, said that the actual percentage of video game players with a compulsive problem was likely to be extremely small, much less than 1%, and that many such people would likely have other underlying problems like depression, bipolar disorder, and I don't like this, but he says autism. I don't think that autism should be treated like a problem. It's just a different way of viewing the world. Uh, People with autism don't have a problem. The world is just not set up for them. It's a, it's a uh, different way of seeing the world that we need to be better at accommodating. Um, I, I don't think autism should be treated as a disease. It's just being differently wired. And I'm differently wired in a lot of ways too. So I, I don't like um, pathologizing autism. I, I think it does a disservice to the, the many, many people who had them. But I digress. Depression, bipolar disorder, totally fair. Anxiety condition, I would add. But much less than 1%. So this guy who has been studying this stuff for 30 years and actually thinks that video games are like gambling, still still says it's smaller than even the article says. So at the most, this article is saying 3% of gamers will become addicts. The expert says it's probably less than 1%, meaning it is exceptionally rare. Why am I fixating on this? Well... Welcome to the New York Times, who never met a gaming story it wouldn't crap on. I have no idea why, but right from the title, we have a problem. Video game addiction tries to move from basement to doctor's office. Not only is that insulting and stigmatizing, it's not even accurate. The experts they talked to for this own article say that part of the problem is that gaming has become more mobile. It's not just for people in basements. It's on phones. So they are invoking a stereotype to be freaking smug and glib for a cutesy headline. And anybody covering mental health, the mental health beat for a major newspaper should know better than to invoke a stigmatizing stereotype in the headline. No, maybe an editor did this. Same thing. If an editor is overseeing a mental health beat, you should not be stigmatizing people who need mental health help. It it discourages people from getting help. And if I sound angry, that's because I am. Um, 
But look at this intro. Video games work hard to hook players. Designers use predictive algorithms and principles of behavioral economics to keep fans engaged. When new games are reviewed, the most flattering accolade might be, I can't put it down. Now the World Health Organization is saying that players can actually become addicted. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, here's the problem, New York Times. Yeah. Yeah. Game designers do use predictive algorithms and principles of behavioral economics to keep consumers engaged. So do supermarkets. So do car manufacturers. You know who else uses predictive algorithms and principles of behavioral economics to keep people on their service longer? Newspapers and online forums. Yep, sorry to break it to you. If you think that video games are hooking players, Deliberately, if you think video games are creating addicts, you are using the same tactics. Where is it? Right down here. All this stuff, the trending, the recommended, the editor's picks, the for you, all that stuff. This is all designed, the related coverage, these are all designed to keep you reading longer. All of it. So... You know, this is a pretty big glass house to throw a stone from. It is not nefarious. Game designers use these tools to create a better experience for their fans a lot of the time, not to make them do things that will make them ill. But let's move on. More, more, more bad, bad, doom and gloom, doom and gloom. And now they start talking to people... um, who seek to financially benefit from an increased number of people seeking treatment for gaming addiction. The Serenity Mountain Adolescent Treatment Branch of the Restart Internet and Video Game Addiction Center. These are for-profit organizations. And see here it is, Serenity Mountain again. Serenity Mountain. This is a company that seeks to benefit by getting more people in. And yet this article cites 2.6 billion people playing video games around the world, including two-thirds of American households. And the industry is expected to grow 31% too. And then they start getting into economic numbers. Why does the economic health of the industry matter in a mental health paradigm? I have no idea. I do have an issue with them taking the word of these very expensive um, inpatient facilities. It's $30,000 for seven days for one person. It says so in this article. So they're, these organizations, these Serenity Mountain restart places, they're thrilled that this is getting recognized because this is good for business. The thing that's different between this article And this article is who they interviewed. They interviewed a lot of people in England for for this article, which of course is is the, the National Health Service. It's socialized. So they're making the same amount of money no matter how many people they have to treat. They're basically salaried doctors. These inpatient facilities are for profit centers that benefit if they artificially push gaming addiction as some sort of epidemic. And, of course, the industry, the New York Times says, pushed back against the World Health Organization classification, calling it deeply flawed. But you notice so far, they're not saying that any doctors have pushed back. They're making it sound like there's a mental health consensus. One doctor actually said that people come in with an addiction to Candy Crush Saga. Look at this quote. I have patients who come in suffering... uh, I have patients who come in suffering from an addiction to Candy Crush Saga, and they're substantially similar to people who come in with a cocaine disorder. What? Okay, I, you know, this this doctor has lost credibility with me. Where is this doctor from? Let's see. Can't, ah, uh, uh. Dr. Petros Lavonis, chairman of the psychiatric de- department at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. So, American institution... Very different, no national health care plan. Money, 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 okay? 
Um, yes, it's a university, which is different. But if you don't think universities are out to make money, you clearly don't have the student debt that some people do. But they just keep bashing at the fact, oh, it's so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad. And they reference World of Warcraft and League of Legends and Candy Crush Saga and all using f terms like uncontrollable cravings. And then they talk about E3. They use a picture from E3. I have no idea why um, League of Legends, World of Warcraft, and Candy Crush Saga are not PlayStation games. Are you seeing the sloppiness of this article? It gets worse, okay? Do you notice that they have not juxtaposed any doctors who disagree mixed in with the doctors who agree here until after a massive photo jump? People stop reading after these huge photo jumps they get bored they think they got the idea it's just beating them over the head at uh you know they talk about a, a woman who's forbidding her 24 year old son to play games after 11 p.m more on that sort of relationship later um but this is the part where i just lost my ginger monkey shit okay because it's just wrong this is just misleading and it's irresponsible an early study published in 2009 found that nearly 9% of young players were addicted to their games. Many experts believe that the number has increased as games have become more advanced, more social, and more mobile. Are you seeing the numerous problems with this? One, more mobile. Your headline talks about people in parents' basements. Which reality are you in right now? The, re the actual reality or the one in your minds where you like to crap on gamers as losers? Or, you know, 9%? Au contraire, 10 years has said you're wrong. Experts in the field have said it's no more than three. And they say 9% and many experts believe the number has increased. Well, other experts don't. There's no consensus on that. This is misleading information. Shame on the New York Times. This is not accurate. Period. End of story. They are making the condition seem worse than it actually is. And they go on more and more and more and, and more like this is practically an ad for Serenity Mountain. Oh, you can do archery and take long, long walks in the woods and play chess and play the sandbox. Oh, this sounds great. Um, you know, uh, game quitters. Um, there's nothing from people pushing back. There's the $3,000 number for seven, sorry, seven weeks. My mistake, not seven days, seven weeks of care, but $30,000 and a month long waiting list. Oh, restarts just rubbing their hands together with this article, right? Like we are going to make so much money. We can open up a whole bunch of new centers with giant chess sets. Um, I think you can see the difference between the articles, right? Between this one who takes a, a, a sane, sober, and balanced uh, uh, look at the issue and this that actually has an agenda. They are actually trying to convince people that this is a big problem suffered by losers whose parents are at their wits' ends. So what do I think? This is what you guys come for. I think that this is... A difficult situation with some pros and cons. And I think that the gaming industry and these health organizations that um, are coming at this issue from two different sides have different priorities. And I think from the people who are bargaining in good faith here, meaning not the New York Times, everybody's right from their perspective. The industry is right that far too much focus is put on the, the alleged negative elements of video games and the people who misuse them and that not enough attention is given to the positives of, of video games on, on cognitive ability and mood and, and all that good stuff. I also think that because this is specifically, well, mostly at young people, except for that one woman who is still nagging her 24-year-old son, um... But that is a shining example of what I'm about to talk about. 
In youth psychiatry, there is a gatekeeping phenomenon with the parents that doctors have to get through. And I can see how a a um, hyper-controlling, nagging parent would feel more comfortable getting their kid help for big, bad, evil video games rotting their minds than a family dynamic or environmental problem in the home or community that is far more likely the cause of their kid's compulsive behavior. Um, I prefer to call this so-called addictive gaming or gaming addiction. I prefer to call it an avoidant compulsive behavior. It's just what people use because their lives suck. If, If people's lives are really good, they don't spend you know, eight hours every night playing World of Warcraft. They do that because their their sense of enjoyment is in the game. The rest of the world is is not kind enough or warm enough or light enough for them to continue to inhabit it. Now, some people are just profoundly introverted or they do have autism and they find it easier to interact with people through a screen and they should not be shamed for that. Um... Those people are not dropping out of school or losing their jobs because of video games. Something is profoundly wrong there. And, you know, you know it's profoundly wrong. And I think it's so funny that, that, you know, the New York Times quoted this particular woman with um, a straight face where, you know... A gift shop owner in Tucson said she started looking for a gaming addiction specialist two years ago after her son failed out of college and was struggling to hold a job. Mrs. DeVries wanted someone who understood her son's seeming compulsion to gaze into a glowing screen for 16 hours on some days, subsisting on crackers and pita chips and listening on a headset to strangers discussing strategy for League of Legends. She struck out. They didn't exist. There was no such thing, she said. Mrs. DeVries now resorts resorts to forbidding her son, 24 years old, to play games after 11 p.m. At times, I'll walk by and hear the tap tapping on his keyboard and it'll make me shudder, she said. Her son declined to be interviewed. Are you guys catching the subtext of this? Are you catching the fact that this guy probably had some sort of depressive condition for quite some time and instead of his mother loving him, she shuddering and telling a 24-year-old not to what to do, forbidding him from playing games after 11 p.m.? Instead of talking to him and understanding what pulls him into these games, she's, she's treating him like a disease. Her son is making her shudder. Gee, I wonder why he's miserable. I wonder why he's 24 years old and is, is kind of given up. This stuff screams at me through these anecdotes. And it's a shining example of how in, in these conditions affecting young people, it often comes from the parents. The problem is the parents are unlikely to want to hear that. And it's very hard for mental health professionals to get through to the parents that they are actually the cause of their kid withdrawing. Now, it could be something else. It could be being, it could be bullying at school. But if you have an open communication with your kid, they will tell you that. Now, I am not talking here about conditions that, you know, develop in, in uh, adolescence like schizophrenia and, and, um, uh, other forms of psychosis and, uh, you know, uh, sociopathy and things like that, that aren't, aren't the parents doing, but most of, you know, adolescent depression, anxiety, it comes from the environment. So it's either happening at school and, you know, maybe that's why he dropped out or maybe it was happening even before college. But in, in this case, when, a woman is talking about her 24-year-old son like he's nine, I think we know where the problem is. The problem is how do you treat that? You have to get around the parents to get at the kid. 
And so a lot of doctors are probably going, okay, Mrs. DeVries, yes, your son has an addiction. Now here's what you have to do because you're a loving, caring, compassionate mother who would do anything for her kid, right? Now in a lot of cases, these situations don't get better because the parents can't let go. But still, that's the tactic. And I understand that tactic. But we still have the far greater social problem of gaming and and things, you know, throughout modern history that, that young men enjoy being stigmatized as, as dangerous and, and, you know, games like World of Warcraft and stuff like that. The player base is primarily male. There are a lot of female WoW players, but more men than women. Um, these, these games, these console games are, are male dominated. We know that. And it's... Men have increasingly had their rites of passage eroded in life. And so they struggle to learn how to be men. Um, women, this is going to sound kind of weird, but women sort of have these these hardwired rites of passage, like getting your period and things like that. There are, are kind of these moments where it's like, oh, okay, this is an obvious step where I'm not a kid anymore. I'm moving towards adulthood. Guys don't have those similar obvious signs. And there used to be, I mean, in, in my religion, there are, um, there are bar and bat mitzvahs. Um, it was originally just bar mitzvahs, but they, you know, they let the girls come too because yeah, why not? Um, but these are sort of early adult rites of passage. A lot of the later life rites of passage for teens becoming young adults have eroded. You know, a lot of teens don't get a driver's license because they live in cities. And, and that's a, a big thing of adulthood. I think voting should be turning 18 and having that right to vote. That should be a big rite of passage. People should do parties. It should be today you are a man. You can help choose our government, you know, because um, that's the same age that that men are allowed in into the, you know, men and women can enlist in the military. But there aren't those um, milestones for people. And so building an identity, especially in this age of prolonged adolescence with people being in school until they're damn near 30, it's very hard to really get a sense of self and, and build an identity when you are on these massive educational institutions where you are just a number, you are a cog in the machine, they're too big to make you feel like an individual. And, um, you know, some people can have sort of the, you know, the, the residence life and, and get a sense of autonomy there. If you stay at home for school, like a lot of people do here because of money, you don't get that separation from your parents. And it makes it really hard to figure out who you are as an individual. Well, games allow that separation from overbearing parents like people are still nagging their clearly depressed son at the age of 24 about him playing video games at 11 o'clock this is this is a direct line here in this case and i i really do understand that there are mental health um practitioners who are tearing their hair out trying to help just trying to get to these kids so they have some hope of helping them, helping them develop healthier, you know, life skills that they didn't get from their parents. But articles like this New York Times thing, they don't help. And I admit I'm bewildered and, and angry every time I see this stuff because I don't know if they still have it, but at one point the New York Times had a content sharing partnership with Kotaku. And I don't understand, well, I know what you guys are going to say, but I don't understand why Kotaku would want to be a part of a, a newspaper that publishes things like this other than money. The enthusiast press should be enthusiasts. We, we should first and foremost be advocating games as the greatest hobby in the world. You know, the greatest form of entertainment in the world. If you don't believe that, GTFO out of games journalism, okay? Because you then you're an activist. You're not like people who review movies love movies. People who review food love food. 
right? People who review cars freaking love cars. They're not going to go on and on about how terrible for the environment they are. You don't see the same thing in gaming. And I think it's because uh, games journalists are trying to suck up to organizations like the New York Times who clearly have a very dim view of gaming. But gaming's not going away. Gaming is, is becoming dominant. The kids growing up today do not know a world without video games on their cell phones. And so like radio and movies and TV and rock and roll and hip hop and all that stuff before it that everybody said was terrible for kids, eventually, you know, these, we're going to find out it's really not so bad. It can be part of a, uh, uh, a healthy and, and socially adjusted life. And these organizations that continue to demonize this stuff never learn. The Associated Press has clearly learned. Somebody talked to the Associated Press. Kotaku got to get talking to the New York Times. But who am I kidding? They're Kotaku. So uh, thanks for watching. I forgot to do the... the Lincoln crowdfunding thing, the patron. Um, I'm in a bit of a, a bit of a dilemma this week because there's this crowdfunding thing that I'm also, but I'll get to that tomorrow. Help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. If you like this kind of stuff, if you like this kind of analysis, I've been doing a lot of analysis this week, a buck a month. We're getting more and more incentives um, at higher amounts, but a buck a month is all you know, I, I really ask just help out because if everybody who watched these videos paid a buck a month, I'd have no problems with money. <laughs> I cannot say that right now. But uh, thanks for watching and uh, enjoy your gaming. Just if anybody gives you grief about it, show them this Associated Press article. I'll put a link to both in the description box. Okay. Okay. Thanks for watching.